pedestrian-only streets. As Americans, we love experiencing them when we go overseas, but we see shockingly few of them in our own country. I'm gonna get into the arguments about why European cities can do this and US cities can't, and why those arguments are just mostly nonsense. It's all coming up. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics, always welcome. And my jumping off point for today is a message I got from one of my patrons. Now that you're in Madrid, it would be cool to see a remake of the Strode ecosystem video, but for walkable streets, i.e. indicator species. Which, if you haven't seen, I did a video that included a section about all the things you see on a strode that tell you the strode is indeed functioning as intended. Mostly injury attorney billboards. Anyway, I liked this idea, but I didn't want to touch it until I was actually done with Spain and had experienced the full range of Spain's walkable urbanism. And I am across the border in Portugal right now, so the time is ripe. I do have to say, along with high-speed rail, this was probably the thing I was most excited about experiencing in Spain. Extremely walkable, car-free streets and plazas. And just trying to immerse myself in those places and understand all the good things they enable. Keep in mind, I lived in suburban Las Vegas for a year, so spending an extended period in a variety of Spanish cities was like a much-needed detox for me. Like an urbanist cleanse. Sorry if that's getting a bit graphic, but that's just what it feels like. Now, I'm not trying to say that the U.S. doesn't have extremely walkable, pedestrian-only streets that are immensely popular and successful, but it's just that they're in theme parks that cost like $100 to get into, or in lifestyle centers that have pretty convoluted rules on acceptable public conduct. Now, some of this I did already cover in my earlier video on Madrid, but I'm not really talking about temporary street closures, which are a good starting point for creating pedestrian-only streets. And I'm not really talking about green spaces, which you do find great linear parks in other Spanish cities, and great beachfront promenades, but those aren't specific to the kind of urbanism I'm talking about. And I'm not really talking about pedestrian bridges, although those are important and cool, or walkable historic monuments like mosque cathedrals or medieval fortresses that occupy huge swaths of a city. But if we're talking about pedestrian-only spaces that are truly characteristic of Spain, I am going to include plazas. These are endemic in a lot of countries over here. And it really is a sort of old-school European urbanism that we've just never really figured out how to do right in the U.S. I talked about Puerta del Sol in my Madrid video where they're in the middle of finally removing all of the motor vehicle access and making it ped only. But great central plazas are important in pretty much every Spanish city. And they kind of have their own indicator species, like definitely giant mushroom structures but often extremely social media friendly, I heart whatever city signs. Plazas are more than just decorative though. In a lot of cities, metro stations are an indicator of a plaza's urban health. All kinds of metro station typologies, and honestly, underground regional rail stations for that matter. If it's a bikeable city like Valencia or Sevilla, bike share stations are gonna be a strong indicator as well. It does make sense. Plazas provide this level of open space and visibility that makes them no-brainers for urban transportation nodes. And I don't know how universal some of these indicators are, but you do get plazas abutting castle walls, plazas inside castle walls, maybe the occasional preserved Roman amphitheater, but more likely actual operating theaters as a plaza's focal point. You might even go so far as to cordon the whole thing off for film festival red carpet events, or maybe marathon finish lines. Or you might just have a first division football stadium in the center of your car-free civic space, although this one gets activated by an indoor-outdoor shopping mall that's on the west side of the stadium, which I'm actually standing on top of in this shot. Another indicator I observed, maybe very specific to this particular location, very odd ceremonies and processions. 
But maybe the most important health indicator, high profile advertising. Not really a huge fan, honestly, unless it's for high speed rail and I did see a lot of that. Okay, let's get to the heart of this and take a look at the health of some very typical urban street indicator species. Because you know, I often hear that if you take away travel lanes or you take away parking, then the lack of motor vehicle access will absolutely strangle local business and the central core of your city will just become a ghost town. So let's see how things are going on car-free streets in the Spanish cities I visited. I mentioned newsstands in a previous video, and I understand retail operations that sell newspapers and magazines aren't the most vibrant businesses these days, but they're actually still hanging on in Spain's pedestrian hubs, and our non-human friends also appreciate car-free spaces. Flower vendors, also a good indicator. Car-free streets are also kind of ideal places to locate public services which are usually best accessed on foot, like mailboxes, or government-run gambling operations where you can certainly try your luck, but you can't do it without <laughs> crossing the path of a black cat. Just devious stuff. Public markets are usually a pretty strong indicator of healthy car-free space. And okay, we have to talk about cafes and cafe culture or tapas culture or whatever you want to call it. Every part of that culture is just better in a car-free space, and busy cafes are a big indicator of a healthy pedestrian street. After all, people here like to hang out and actually have conversations with each other. They like to be outside, and deleting traffic noise from the equation is a huge plus. It's a bit similar to a French cafe scene where you're nominally paying for food and drink, but in a sense, you're really paying rent on a piece of real estate where you can gather together and see people and be seen. It's kind of the opposite of the US where in a lot of cities, the most successful eating establishments are on six lane strodes with ginormous parking lots. Eh, maybe Spain will figure out how to do this right at some point. And sometimes you just want to grab food and go, and there's a healthy number of storefronts that specialize in creative combinations of bread and meat, or vehicles for cheese delivery, or the regional beverage of choice, and there always is one. Density of ice cream establishments is a pretty universal indicator too. It is very good walking around food. Same with bubble waffles, I guess. I honestly had to Google this to figure out what it was. Wasn't disappointed. Orange juice stands, or just orange stands. Space for industrious street vendors selling extremely authentic, high fashion merchandise for shockingly low prices. But really, it's about storefronts. In an earlier video, I told you how store receipts went up like 10% after they took travel lanes off the Gran Via in Madrid. Well, based on my ironclad analysis, retail shops clearly thrive in pedestrian-only environments. All of these are pretty strong indicator species. Shops that sell Libros. Shops that sell charming office accoutrements. Specialty products to satisfy your timekeeping requirements. Shoes. Scarves for <laughs> three euro. Flamenco gear? In Sevilla, I think you're legally required to have a dress and a fan in your possession at all times. Produce markets that specialize in just a single fruit. Stores I didn't even realize still existed. Stores that maybe shouldn't exist or you just wish there wasn't demand for. Shops that sell goods of unquestionable Spanish authenticity. And I'm pretty sure every city with a healthy pedestrian center has a Made in X shop where X is just the name of the city. Stores that I still don't understand exactly what it is they actually sell, but I decided I just don't like the way this cow looks at me. We just aren't going to be best friends. It's not all about retail either. There's a lot of housing on these kind of streets too. And I guess there are some elements that aren't going to be replicable in the US. Ancient city walls, cathedral towers, expansive views of the Mediterranean. Okay, that was a bit of a laundry list, but 
The point is, there are just a lot of things you can do on a street where pedestrians come face to face with shopping and services that you can't do on, say, a six lane strode where you're really limited in the kinds of businesses and residential land use types that are viable. And the thing is, some of the most successful pedestrian streets I saw were plenty wide enough to accommodate vehicle traffic, but the city just elected not to go that route. Avenida de la Constitución in Sevilla is a great example. They put everything but cars on the street and it's just bonkers busy all the time. The weird flip side of this is a lot of the very narrow streets in these Spanish cities do accommodate vehicle traffic and it's kind of a nightmare. Like, I can't even figure out the purpose of allowing vehicular traffic on this super narrow street that runs in front of this 350 year old bar in Sevilla. It's an absolute civic treasure, so why not just pedestrianize the space in front of it? I mean, to be fair, when they do have traffic on these narrow streets, they make it pretty clear that cars are interlopers. Anyway, the point here is, the fact that there are pedestrianized streets that are plenty wide enough for vehicle traffic and extremely narrow streets that do permit vehicle traffic really means that this is less about whether European city streets are narrow or not and more about the choices a city makes. I'm gonna get a little more into the arguments about why US cities can't pedestrianize their streets to the same level as European cities do, and why those arguments are mostly nonsense. But first, brief reminder to drop a like on the video and consider subscribing slash hitting the notification bell. If you enjoy content every Wednesday on whatever it was I decided to make a video about that week, connect on the apps for additional content and consider joining the Patreon if you want to help directly support keeping the lights on at Nerd HQ. Okay, so there's this kind of pernicious thinking out there that this level of pedestrianization can only be done in older European cities where development predates the automobile. And embedded in that is the assumption that just because old streets in the US happen to be wide enough to accommodate cars, they should continue to do so in perpetuity. And to be fair, the problem with retrofitting streets isn't so much the width as the fact that US cities managed to build parking garages and driveway accesses on so many downtown streets even in maybe especially ones that predate the automobile entirely. Another way of looking at this is most US cities have central cores that do predate the automobile. So all the concessions we've made to facilitate motor vehicle access and parking are already themselves retrofits. So let's not act like having driveways everywhere is the natural order of things and pedestrianization is some sort of unreasonable intervention. You're really just deciding which kind of retrofit you think is acceptable. I mean, it was noticeable to me when I did last week's video on undervalued small cities that a lot of those cities had at least some form of car-free downtown street. So I'm not trying to tell you it's realistic or even desirable to pedestrianize every street in an entire city, but based on what I've seen, I'd have to say US cities are way under provisioned on car-free streets and we could do with a little more bravery from our elected officials when it comes to moving things in the right direction. I understand it's tough to make big changes when you have to face an election every two or four years, but what's the point of getting elected in the first place if you aren't going to do a big thing that has benefits that are practically too numerous to mention? Okay, that's all I got. Thanks for joining today, and thanks to the patrons for helping keep this channel solvent while I soldier on in this nomadic existence. Another week, another <laughs> subway kitchen tile backdrop. Eh, at least this one has a Nespresso machine. Ristretto for the win. The patron support just does mean a lot. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week, and I'll see you then.